Real Talk USA. Hello, everyone. This is our weekly show, Real Talk USA, on 105.3 FFM, and it's me, your Solomon, with Chris Mead. Hello, Chris. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing good. You? I'm, I'm good, man. We came to your place this time. Yes. <laughs> it's really nice to have you here. <laughs> <laughs> usually, for people that can't see, usually uh, EUO will come over to the embassy, but uh, today we came to a soundproof room today. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's very nice. You need to, you, I guess you can't put pictures up or anything up here. No. <laughs> no? Okay. When I was in a... I was in a band in Australia, and they had egg cartons on the oh, walls, yeah. uh, like you yes. know the things you carry eggs in. Yes, you put those on the walls for some reason that absorbs sound as well. Yes, we used to have that previously. We changed it recently. Yeah, I, I think it's a well shows you've got some money. I, <laughs> I, mean, I think it's, it was a studio. The studio that we were doing it in was very. Yeah, it was professional, but it was also kind of improvised as well. So. <laughs> yeah. So what do we have today? Well, today uh, we have a Samantha Lakin. Did I say your last name right? I never asked you how to say yes, it. Yes, it's Lakin. <laughs> Samantha Lakin. Uh, and uh, she is here. She's a PhD candidate at the Strasser Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University, which is in Massachusetts. Uh, and she has. she's a Fulbright Scholar. Uh, and she is has been working in Rwanda for the. You've been there for five years. Yes, I've been there since 2013. That's incredible. And you speak uh, you speak French, and what the language is? Yes, Kenya Rwanda. I have a pretty good working knowledge of Kenya Rwanda. Wouldn't say I'm fluent, but I'm able to get by. Very good. <laughs> and you're there working on your PhD, which is in. Uh, Yep, so I'm there working on dissertation research. I'm a Fulbright Scholar in Rwanda this year, and the research is focused on memory and transitional justice in the aftermath of genocide, which took place in Rwanda in 1994. Okay, so let's let's talk about a little bit about that. Before we get in, I mean, that's a very heavy subject. Yes, uh, it is. Be, so let's, let's lighten it up at the beginning a little bit. Before we went on, you mentioned that I asked if you had any interesting hobbies. You said tap dancing. Yes. So can you let, and you went into this whole thing about tap dancing and about how you got to build. It was. I, I do not have any experience whatsoever with tap dancing. I, my wife would claim I have no experience with dancing at all. <laughs> I think I'm not bad, but you know, whatever. You know. So can you tell us a little? Can you tell us a little bit about tap dancing. How did you get into tap dancing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like many young people, children in America, I was sent to dance classes. And um, tap was something that specifically stuck with me. Uh, rhythmic dancing, creating rhythms, uh, building on them, being able to have a musicality, dancing with jazz music, both recorded and live music, and really creating um, some kind of movement and feeling from the rhythm. Um, and so for me, tap dancing was a great form of expression, of physical activity, and as I got a bit, bit better at it, I started to do it more, and it was the kind of thing um, that really just spiraled. Um, I now dance in Boston um, with a teacher who I've been with for 10 years since college. Um, I take semi-professional classes and do some performances. In college, I was the founder of Hooked on Tap at Brandeis University, wow. which was our full tap ensemble. Um, and it's really a great way also to clear your mind. As you said, the subject I work with is really heavy. And so tap dance, and I'm also in a West African dance troupe called Ben Kadi in the Boston area. Does that mean something? Ben Kadi means coming together in, in Malayan language. language. In what? A Malayan language. A Malayan? Ma Malay Malayan. Malayan. I forget. Now I, I wish I knew. Yeah. Like the country Mali? Mali, yeah. Ah, in okay, the language, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah okay. I now forget the name of the language because I'm so focused on East Africa. But um, <laughs> Ben Kadi means coming together sweetly. And um, it's really just that. It's a group of all kinds of people from America, from Africa, black, white, men, women, uh, dancing together and being able to perform and to learn traditional uh, dance from West Africa. So it, it, does tap figure into that at all? Um, I think the point is it's somewhat rhythmic because we do okay. dance with djembe drums. So the type of, um, we don't use music, but we use djembe. Um, and so it's also a kind of a rhythmic, rhythmic dance. So they and fit that, together. So in the course of like just the chat that we had before we came on, I I stoop. I mean, I I I didn't know that tap is an American art, like a, an mm -hmm. American form of dance. And I didn't know. I mean, like I'll be honest. I mean, tap like the tap that I'm familiar with. I it was and I mentioned. Uh, 
Who did I even mention? Fred Astaire Fred, singing Fred, in the Fred rain. Fred Astaire singing in the rain, which is about the the whitest movie that you can watch, <laughs> right? And so I just thought it was this thing. I didn't I didn't know it came from black the black community. Yeah. So tap dance started in black uh, communities in America with a number of um, different dancers. Um, with Jimmy Slide, Gregory Hines, today Savion Glover, and many others. And um, it's an art form now for all, but hoofing or kind of a rhythmic type of tap is very different than what we call like a Broadway style, mm. which is what Fred Astaire was doing um, in that movie. And so that deals, as I said, a lot with jazz music. Your shoes are your instrument. You kind of build them up in the way that you want to create a good bass sound or a good tenor sound based on your toe or your heel taps. And um, yeah, you get to do a lot of fun tricks and a lot of creating really incredible rhythms with your with your feet. Wow. So. Uh, so you're originally from Boston? No, I'm actually originally from New Jersey. I grew okay. up there and I went to high school all the way through high school in New Jersey. Um, I started my education at Brandeis University uh, in the Boston area and then continued. I did my Master's um, of Arts in International Law and Diplomacy at the Fletcher School at mm. Tufts, also Boston. And now I'm at the Strasser Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Clark University, also Boston area. And each time I had a choice to go to Washington, D.C., and I chose Boston. Well, wow. okay. <laughs> I wonder if you'd make that same... Like, Washington, D.C. is sort of a city that's really come of age in the last 10 years. Like, people used to be... I mean, it just used to be for political people and people that were born there, but now, like, it's this... Called a hipster oasis, but like you know, all about everybody moving into the city. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you'd make that same decision today. But. Yeah, it depends. You know, it'll depend on where the job world leads. But um, you don't get more hipster sometimes than Cambridge or Somerville in Boston. Yeah, that's um, probably true. But one thing I like about living there is just the intellectual capacity. There are so many universities um, and people thinking all the time critiquing, analyzing, and that intellectual energy is one of the things I love about living in the Cambridge, Somerville, Boston, Massachusetts area. Well, let's talk about the uh, Strasser Center for Holocaust and uh, Genocide Studies. What, what, what is that? Yes, so um, the PhD program I'm in is at Clark University, which is a mostly undergraduate program, but there are three main PhD programs. One is their program in geography, which is world-renowned. Another is in social psychology, and the third is ours in Holocaust and Genocide Studies, which is based in the history department. And so people who are at our center, including me, are working on all kinds of issues of mass violence, mass atrocity, even beyond cases of legally defined genocide. We have people working on Armenia, on the Holocaust, on Bangladesh, on Sudan, Kenya, Rwanda, um, Bosnia, former Yugoslavia, many cases. And so um, I tend to feel that my work extends way beyond the name of the center um, into fields of justice seeking and understanding how people um, can be resilient in times of extreme trauma and extraordinary crimes. I also come from a background of um, international justice and diplomacy and so um, that also plays into my degree in, in, in history and the way that I interview people, take oral history testimonies, and work with archives in my, in my work. Okay. How, what took you to Rwanda? Yeah, so um, I actually had another Fulbright in 2011, 2012 in Switzerland, and I was working um, with Jewish children who were clandestinely rescued to Switzerland during World War II to escape the Nazi regime. And this got me very interested in victim-based interviews and how that might be able to impact policy on different levels. And it was a really important time in Switzerland because they were coming to terms with what happened during World War II and the fact that Switzerland was not so completely neutral. They did rescue many people, but there were also some negative aspects of the war and collaboration that happened. And so it was a great time to be researching what happened to these refugee children in Switzerland. Um, and I had wonderful cooperation with the Swiss Embassy in Washington, D.C. and the United States Embassy in Bern, Switzerland. Um, from there, I actually went to the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy, and I felt like an outsider. 
I felt like someone who had studied modern European history, um, who didn't really know where I was when everybody was working on modern cases. And it was there that I discovered the concept of transitional justice, which is really helping societies move from states of conflict um, to times of sustainable peace. And with that, I was offered an internship, um, as many are in their, um, in between their first and second years of the master's, at the Kigali Genocide Memorial in Rwanda. And from there, I worked at the Genocide Archive of Rwanda. Uh, I was hired on to actually found the Department of Research Policy and Higher Education at the Genocide Memorial. And from there, I really fell in love with Rwanda. And I fell in love with the research that I was doing, working with survivors, former perpetrators, ordinary citizens, um, and just really getting into one place. Mm -hmm. I wanted to know something, and I felt like Rwanda was a great fit for... Um, the ability to make an impact. Um, speaking French helped, learning Kenya Rwanda helped, and it just spiraled from there. Okay. So uh, let's talk about some of your research. You mentioned uh, victim-based uh, interviews and and the role that memory plays in transitional justice. Can you talk a little bit about that, please? Yeah, sure. So um, one of the biggest things I often see, because I came from a policy background at the Fletcher School and have now moved into a really traditional um, in some ways academic PhD program is a divide between policymakers and those at the top level um, and local individuals and how they interpret policy or how they interpret some of the justice mechanisms that have been taking place in their country. And so in Rwanda we have a high level of m memory culture of memorials created on the side of the road that are mass graves dedicated to the victims who were killed during the 1994 genocide, mostly Tutsi but also some Hutu who are opposed to the extremist regime. And we have a 100 day period every year of mandated kwibuka or commemoration. And so my interest was not really at the political level, but was to understand how local Rwandans engage with these kinds of memory mechanisms and how they might or might not render a sense of justice um, for those who had experienced crimes as victims, for those who had been put in prison afterward, whether rightfully or wrongfully, for those who had to live in Rwanda and move past genocide. Um, one of my interviewees had said genocide affected everyone in this nation and even every Rwandan across the world. It wasn't only a survivor's issue, but every person was affected by the fact that the country was nearly destroyed. And the decision to move forward as one country and live together was a, um, was a deliberate decision in many ways. And so my understanding is trying to figure out how do local individuals engage in these policies and then trickling which, back up. Which policies? Train policies about memory. Okay. So policies about how memorial sites are created, what are placed there, how often people visit them, when do people go to commemoration, what is said there, who can be remembered, these kinds of existential and very practical in many ways questions about how to remember the past but also move forward in a healthy and sustainable way um, because memory creates tensions. Not everybody sitting in the same room or at the same commemoration or at the same memorial site is remembering the same mm -hmm. thing about the past. So how do we take all of these needs and desires that people have and try and create some kinds of compromise or space where they can be recognized and feel free to remember but also imagine for the future. And so um, the goal, again, for the research would be to have this evidence-based research, as we say, where we're actually talking to people on the ground. I've interviewed over 130 people so far. Um, and try to communicate that to policymakers and those in charge who often might seem disconnected from what people on the ground and who are living the reality really want out of these sites and spaces. Well, let's talk a little bit about your, your approach. I mean, evident, evidence-based versus memory. You know, I as a recovering lawyer, mm -hmm. I mean, I do remember that, you know, there's elaborate rules of evidence set mm -hmm. up to only allow in, you know, credible testimony. Mm -hmm. And people often misremember things. You, you can have three different people say, yes, I was there. Well, what did you see? Mm -hmm. I saw a man in a red shirt. 
I saw a man in a blue shirt, I saw a man in a green shirt, and it's all the same person, right? Mm -hmm. And so, how, if you could talk a little bit about how uh, the, the difference between evidence based versus, uh, mm -hmm. you know, memory. Yeah, sure. Know, and and I, I would find that interesting. Yeah. So, when we as scholars deal with memory, we're not looking for truth with a capital T or forensic truth which is what you might be looking for in a court of law, which is, can we find the mass grave? Can we find the bone? Can we find the individual who did it? What is the date that this massacre happened? Those things are what we call forensic or historical truth. And they're oftentimes truth with a capital T. They're non-negotiable. They happened on that date. This many range of people were killed, etc. So when we talk about interviews, and memory changes over time as well, you can interview someone and interview them five years later or five days later and it might change. So instead of looking for forensic or historical truth or evidence, we look at the, I look in the analysis for um, the way that people interpret the things that have happened to them, including going to the memorial sites and, and attending the commemorations. Why, and why so, do you focus on that versus, uh, <clears throat> you know, the bones or the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the grave site or, or yeah. the photographs. Yeah, right? so I do focus on both in some ways. Now, the historical truth is generally what historians do, right? They're the ones who go in and the commissions of inquiry set up by United Nations or others who come in and they determine the facts of the genocide. What happened on what date? When did it unfold? In which province? Etc. And a lot of that work's already been done in Rwanda. Um, there are books and a lot of documentation about when genocide unfolded where, who were the major actors, who were the major perpetrators, what positions did they hold. So for me, what's interesting is why does someone feel the way they do about a mechanism. What is it about their, when I say mechanism, I mean a memorial site or a commemoration process. What is it about their background, about their history, about who they are that makes them state a certain thing or a certain transcript? And if it's candid to them, if it's true for them. And so um, it's a little bit different of an approach because it deals with perspective. But the perspective is the lived reality for that person. It's what they believe and what they is candid and true for themselves. And so I feel that if we take oral history and we look at memory and we try to fit it in a box of history or factual forensic evidence, we're kind of mixing things up and doing the wrong thing. Factual and forensic evidence is one thing and it needs to be paired against memory. So when someone might tell me the wrong date for something, I don't interrupt them, I keep going, because I know factually I can fact check that against historians' work, against some of the prior work. What I'm really interested in is how do they interpret what's happening around them, and how can that be better in terms of seeking justice and validation, or how has it been in some ways harmful or not yielded justice. And that's, I think, where the policy implication comes in. Um, and so they are two different things. And one thing about evidence-based research is just any research that's done well is essentially evidence-based research. We don't mean rules of evidence or, or standards of evidence um, inter as, as in law, as lawyers mean it. What we mean is that research has been conducted in a systematic, methodologically sound way, that the information gathered is candid, is authentic, and is meaningful for the community that it's collected from. So whether it's research about healthcare or about um, about agriculture, or satisfaction with programs, whatever it is, if that research is done in a methodologically sound way, it's considered evidence based. Okay. Whether it's also qualitative or quantitative. Well, look, you know, I I don't want to presume uh, we are in Africa, uh, but you know, lot, most of as you know, Africa is young, so there there's probably. I would like to believe there are people out there listening to our show who are too young to remember what happened. So why don't we back up a little bit and talk about uh, Rwanda and what happened in 1994 because I think it has some implications for some other things that are going on in the continent and for how we sort of help as we move forward to try to resolve conflicts or look at post-conflict situations. There's probably some, some lessons to be drawn. Yeah, absolutely. So to give a very brief historical overview, um, Rwanda became independent from Belgian colonization in 1962 and 63. And um, 
during Belgian colonization, especially during the 1930s and 1940s... Was it, was it its own colony? Um, was, no, was it, it was Rwanda, Burundi, and Belgian Congo. So there were parts of Congo um, as well, and, and also okay. Burundi. Interesting. Um, so it was, that was all considered part of Belgian Congo. Um, and so, as was quite common and kind of a fad in the 1930s and 40s in Europe, was eugenics and race ideology. And so Hutu and Tutsi identities, which were really class-based identities, were kind of manipulated and almost um, became salient as ethnic identities. Why, why do you say they're class-based? Did we were one in the ruling class and one typically were... So there was a patronage system okay. um, where, and some owned cattle, which meant wealth, and others were pastoralists or farmers. Um, so some people say that um, Tutsi means patron and Hutu means client. That's wow. all that it means. So there's a long history, which I can't go into now, but of a buhake, of a, of a clientelism system. Mm -hmm. And many say it was harmful, some say it was necessary. There's big debates around that. But the thing to focus on now, I think, is that Belgians, in the fad of race ideology, solidified Hutu and Tutsi. People could move between them as they gained or lost wealth. Um, and what the Belgians did was they created identity cards and said anyone who over owned over 10 cows was Tutsi and who owned fewer was Hutu. And this became a new very meaningful identity when once it was second, third, fourth, fifth identity to your clan, your family, your gender, your, you know, uh, location, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so once these were solidified uh, and during independence, a Hutu hardliner government came to power, the, Habia, the Kayabanda government. How did they come to power? So they it had may not a, be, it, Maybe yeah. this isn't important, I, yeah. but I'm curious. No, 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 absolutely. I'm happy to tell you. So there was a social revolution, um, essentially, with the opening of space for political parties, and it was the Parme Hutu, the extremist Hutu party, that gained the most power, mm -hmm. mostly because there was an educated um, counter-elite uh, of Hutus, who had mostly been educated actually through the Catholic Church. As they tried to reach the Tutsi kingship, they educated a Hutu counter-elite who led a movement for um, essentially liberation of, of Hutu people, um, but at the exclusion and discrimination of Tutsis. Mm -hmm. And so that was an ethnic-based party, um, Parme Hutu led by Grégoire Kaibanda, which came to power at first. Um, many re Tutsis refugees fled the country, and in 1973 there was a coup um, where President um, Juvenal Habyarimana from the north took power from Kaibanda, also a Hutu hardliner president. So we have, from the 1960s up until 1994, um, really a time of propaganda, discrimination, dehumanization of Tutsi people. Um, and of course, not every Hutu was participating in that. It really came from the top down, but many people did listen to the radio and were involved in those kinds of activities. Um, but there weren't really many killings. And on April 6th, 1994, the plane... Well, it, was, it, was, it wasn't a democracy. It, it was, no. How did they come to power and how did they retain it? So the first um, Kayabanda government came to power through... Um, kind of like proxy elections, they weren't real. Um, they kind of just usurped power when there was a power vacuum when the um, colonialists left. Mm -hmm. And then the military coup was actually, um, the Javier Ramana replaced Kaibanda, so there were no elections. Mm -hmm. So there were no mul mul there was no multi-party system until the 1990s, um, mm -hmm. when some Western countries tried to, and, and successfully, um, encourage Rwanda to open up and create new political parties, um, which is one case where the Rwandan Patriotic Front, who had been exiled in and formed in Uganda, was able to enter the political sphere and gain some seats in Parliament during the Arusha Accords, which eventually failed. Mm -hmm. um, and so on April 4th, 1994, um, a, a, the plane carrying President Javier Ramana from Arusha from signing the Accords back to Kigali 
um, was shot down. Again, it's, uh, we don't know exactly who shot the plane down. And the next day, um, even people even more extreme, Hutus even more extreme than Javier Imana started the killings of what people call the big genocide, lasting from April 7th until July 4th, uh, 1994. And, uh, between 800,000 and 1 million people estimated by the United Nations were killed in that time, mostly Tutsi who were targeted based on who they were and also who to who refused to participate or who were not um, supporting the extremist regime. And, and in the most brutal ways possible as well. Most brutal ways possible. We really think about this as what we call a low-tech genocide. People using farm tools, machetes. Um, I was saying this morning even people would pay to be killed with a bullet instead of a farm tool or a machete. They'd pay a little bit if they had some money and say, I'd rather be killed with a bullet. Um, and so high numbers of rape and then murder after rape, um, and also high mass complicity uh, with people encouraging killings at roadblocks, very public killings. And these were things that were highly anti-cultural in Rwanda. Um, the public nature of killings, the um, public nature of rape, these are things that are very taboo in Rwandan culture. I really want to understand the basics, mm -hmm. like um, how do you define genocide and ethnic cleansing and mass killing? Mm -hmm. Uh, are they one and the same? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think what's really important is um, to understand that in the international legal order and international legal system, there are different crime categories, which means that they describe different um, different patterns of violence, different intentions, and different outcomes and responses. So the three main crime categories in international crimes are war crimes, crimes against humanity, and crimes of genocide. And those are the three that are set out in the Rome Statute by the International Criminal Court, the ICC. And one of the main differences about genocide is that it's the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, members of certain groups, ethnic, religious, and other um, racial identity groups. Um, does not include political groups. Um, and so there are some limitations to that, but that's essentially what genocide is. Mass killing is just as it sounds on a mass scale. It can include war crimes, it can include crimes against humanity, it can include crimes of genocide. One thing I mentioned this morning as well during our talk at IPSS is that there's really no pent ultimate crime. Each crime is different and unique and needs to be different and unique to be able to analyze it under, under international law and prosecute people who are responsible for those crimes. But they're all terrible. In every case, people are dying and people are suffering. In every case. And so it's not that, oh, genocide, we have to have our, our crime called a genocide to get international attention or to get a special court or something like that. For me, I don't believe in that. I believe that all of these crime categories are equally as significant. They just describe different patterns of violence and different ways that um, violence is, is taken against civilians or other other people like militias or military. Does that answer your question a bit? Yes. Great. Mm, talking about the, the Rwandan genocide, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is the role of the media mm -hmm. yeah. in inciting the violence. Mm -hmm. How can you describe the, the role of the media and journalists? Yeah, I think that the role of the media in Rwanda is one of the highest and most proven cases where media played a very high role in propagating um, hate speech, discriminatory speech. One of the jokes in Rwanda we say is that everybody has a radio, even still today, and everyone did have a radio. So there was RTLM, the radio um, television, I'm sorry that I forget the main name now because I'm a bit tired, but Radio RTLM was a hate speech radio, and um, I think three of the pe leaders of the radio were indicted by the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and found guilty of crimes of genocide. And one, Hassan Geze, will actually be up for early release um, later this year. And it's very scary that one of the main organizers and mouthpieces of hate speech, of dehumanization, of discrimination, and of cleavages between Hutu and Tutsi is going to be released back into um, the world. And uh, we don't know how, if there will be protections against his ability to incite 
hatred anymore and people are really worried about it. So it's a very timely question as people call it the media case. I mean, the media case, this is one of the only cases in international law that deals with media as a, as a perpetrator of genocide, essentially. So I think it plays a very important role. But on the other hand, if media can play an important role for hatred, media can play an important role for peace. And that's something we have to remember, that if it can play important roles for very bad things, media can also play an important role for very good things. There, there's a whole area of journalism called peace journalism. Mm -hmm. It gets to this very thing. I mean, the sad thing is is that it's not profitable, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's it should be, right? If it bleeds, it leads, right, is what they say in journalism, that you know, people like the sensational, they like car crashes, they, I mean, anyway, so, and they did, they didn't have Twitter back then, mm -mm. They, uh, I mean, can you imagine? Yeah, it was mostly, again, this, mostly the radio, there was also a newspaper called Kangura, which, um, published, um, articles and, um, calls to action of who choose to start to turn against their neighbors, not to marry Tutsi wives, not to give jobs to certain people. So a lot of the discriminatory policies were funneled through the media, through Kangura, the newspaper, through RTLM, the radio, um, through government newspapers as well. So I think media played a huge role. It's just unfortunate that, you know, I think the way the human mind works sometimes is like that negative um, always trumps the positive in terms of news, that people want to watch the devastating and we get one kind of good neighbor, good humanitarian story um, for every 10 or 15 mm -hmm. Um, hard stories and um, how to change that I don't know yeah. I don't work in journalism but yeah. it's a good thing to think about what about uh, the main perpetrators of the, the Rwanda genocide were the inter Hamui group after the genocide were they persecuted appropriately or, and how was the, the mm. peace and reconciliation process yeah so it's a big question about the inter Hamui also the ex far the ex force Ame Rwanda um, which is the military. So it was in Tarahamwe was a youth militia, um, mostly made up of young men specifically who had come to Kigali, didn't have jobs, and were recruited into a youth militia that even started training before um, April 7th, and that was some indicators that genocide was planned and prepared. Um, and the ex-FAR, um, the Force Armée Rwanda as well, the military. Um, itself. And I think that, you know, the question of has prosecution been done well, part of transitional justice is looking beyond punishing perpetrators. So punishing perpetrators, whether it's through the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, national prosecutions in the country of Rwanda, national prosecutions in third party countries like the UK or the US or Belgium or France or the Netherlands, or through local mechanisms like the gachacha courts where people were kind of sitting on the grass and um, genocide there were um, encouraged to confess what they did and receive lower sentences. This again was for lower level perpetrators, not the big fish, not the masterminds. Has that been done well? For some people, punishing perpetrators is very satisfying to see that person having served a prison sentence or still serving a prison sentence. But within the framework that I work, transitional justice, it's not enough just to punish perpetrators. We also need to be focusing on restoring victims and restoring the society and the social trust as a whole. And so going back to the memory issues, that's where these memorials have and the commemoration processes have a potential to bring people together and create space for dialogue, to remember different things at the same time and in the same space in a non-threatening way um, that can help people really um, move forward in a, in a way that social trust is rebuilt. The thing about genocide in Rwanda is that social trust was completely broken. You know, there were Hutus married to Tutsi, people were neighbors, people had a godmother or godfather, Maren or Paren is a very strong system in Rwanda, who was Hutu or Tutsi and the child was a different, different, you know, uh, group. And the social fabric and social ties and social trust was completely uprooted. And so the justice has to go beyond, I think, punishing perpetrators to really mend the harms of of the uprooting of social trust. And we're 24 years after genocide, but we're still working toward that. 
Now, how does your work? Uh, so let's, let's let's dig a little bit into transitional justice. So how does how does your work in exploring memory uh, factor into what transitional justice is, and how do you how do you put a society back together? That's so yeah. I mean, where people were calling each other cockroaches, and you know, seeing people. I mean, the the worst murders imaginable. How do you walk away from that and rebuild a country? Mm -hmm. how, how do you not give in to the desire for revenge? How yeah. does it just not perpetuate itself over and over again? Yeah, well, I think the desire for revenge is always there, but the acts are different. And that's where I think that transitional justice has some recommendations and mechanisms that work in different contexts um, that help kind of people get through their own trauma or their own um, views of what happened to be able to move forward. Many times people say simply, it's for my children. I don't care about what happens to me. I've already suffered the worst. All I want is my children to grow up, to go to school, to get a good job. And many people do feel that the survival generation is kind of lost, that they will never achieve true reconciliation. I hope that's not true, but it might be that the young, the next generation are the ones who can really do it. In terms of where memorialization fits into transitional justice, as I said, there are kind of two aspects of transitional justice. One is the juridical, looking at um, punishing perpetrators and court-based justice, and the other is more holistic restorative justice, looking at victim-centric, uh, survivor-centric um, mechanisms like public apologies, memorial days, creating plaques or mass graves or things like that. And so I work on the second aspect of memorialization, the restorative justice. We can also call it symbolic justice. And when I say symbolic, I mean something about the heart, right, where it shows people where they stand in the society, that their experiences matter, promises from government and others that this will not happen again, um, ensuring safety and validation that what happened to you was real and that it was serious and that, again, it won't happen again. So um, within the symbolic framework and the restorative framework, as I said, public apology is one of those types of things. Um, reparations are one of those things, either monetarily or symbolically. Um, but also memorialization is one. Um, and that's kind of where it fits into the whole framework. And many people believe if you, if you do X, Y, and Z for memorialization, if you create these kinds of things, then people will feel X, Y, or Z. But from the lived experiences that I've documented in Rwanda, we see that it's much more complex than that, that there are so many divergent and diverse opinions. And the real question is how to, how to capture and support them all in one policy or one space or one site or one process. I can't say I figured that out, and I can't say in my whole career I will ever figure it out, but those of us who work together in these networks of transitional justice practitioners and academics and lawyers and many people, because transitional justice is across all fields, we're trying together to figure it out from different cases, what's worked and what's not worked. Let me ask this question. I mean, I, I think, uh, so let's talk a little bit about what you did today. So you you actually came into town to work on a, uh, to give a uh, give a talk at IPSS, Institute for Peace and Security Studies, which is the first collaboration that USAU has actually had with IPSS. We're, it was a very, I thought it was a very successful day, but uh, talk, talk a little bit about, you know, what, what, are, what were some of the recommendations that you shared mm -hmm. with the group today? Like yeah. in terms of how in rebuilding society, post-conflict, you know, one, I, let me back up, I'm ram. this is what I do, right, I can start, start riffing here. You did mention that the guns have to stop before people can move forward, and peace agreements, when people sign peace agreements, that if they're still shooting each other, if people are still dying, that it's not worth the paper it's written on. I mean, you didn't say that exactly, but kind of what it is, right, I mean... Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah I mean, we have we, cases. You don't, you don't have a, you don't really have a pathway. Like in, in Rwanda, it was a military, there was a military outcome, mm -hmm. right? But in some of these other conflicts that just kind of drag on and drag on, transitional justice can't begin until 
the yeah. fighting ends. Yeah, and this is something we spoke about with Ambassador Mary Beth Leonard um, from the U.S. Uh, mission to the AU and also with a number of Sudanese civil society members last night during my visit here as well is South that Sudanese. South Sudanese, yeah. excuse me, South Sudanese um, civil society activists that um, there's a sequencing to transitional justice. Transitional justice is transitional in nature because it has to come after violence ends and people have to have belief and faith in the fact that when an agreement is signed there will not be killing on the ground at the same time. Um, and that, to me, looking back at the Arusha Accords from Rwanda, at the Arusha Accords in Burundi, um, many of those failed because the ceasefire was agreed to, but people were still dying and being killed on the ground. And it's that cognitive dissonance of saying, we know from the political leaders we're being told one thing, that the violence has stopped, but we can see on the ground that the violence is continuing what faith do we have in the next processes? And so I think there's a sequencing about transitional justice that can turn into a real policy recommendation that we can be thinking about transitional processes for South Sudan, for DRC, for um, Burundi, and for many other context, but what has to happen first before transitional processes can do what they're supposed to do and can do their best work. Um, and that's really the violence coming to an end. And that is even a different subject in itself, mm -hmm. is how do you mediate and negotiate settlements to violent conflict. And not, not necessarily, not a part of transitional justice necessarily. I think it's a precursor. I think mm -hmm. it's a sequencing and it's a precursor and that there really has to be a moment of time that's ready for a transition, for transitional justice to occur. Um, and for the society to be ready to move from conflict to peace. And so I think with some of these situations, we're a little bit early, but I'm happy that we're thinking about the transitional mechanisms that will work in those societies, because what it means is we can only act that much faster and that much more effectively if we're already considering transitional mechanisms. And it's also a signaling, right? If we signal that we're considering transitional mechanisms, we're signaling that we expect this violence is going to end and people have the political will to work toward it ending. And so for me, I also feel like there's a signaling in, in looking at and thinking about publicly transitional mechanisms and transitional justice mechanisms signals that we expect the violence to end and we expect people to act a certain way in their public and, and, um, and leadership capacity. And I, I think another good lesson that uh, you you got me to think about specifically is when the fighting stops, transitional justice isn't just something that like it's like a bolt out of the sky and boom it happens. People go to jail, people then start moving on, holding hands and skipping into the future where there's rainbows and unicorns, right? I mean, people still carry those scars 24 years on in in Rwanda yes uh, people I mean we looked at these photographs you showed a photograph today of a victim uh, of a, a perpetrator and a victim and they were not they were not okay with each other mm -hmm. one was more less okay than the other one mm -hmm. in that photograph and so it it's it goes on for a long time yeah and I think the consequences of something as as grave as extraordinary crimes whether as I said they're genocide crimes against humanity war crimes ethnic cleansing mass atrocities whatever label you put on them um, that is deep you know and then the survival. Why did I survive? The existential questions you ask yourself. How can I see the person who killed my family every day? How can I buy from them if they're the only shop in my village? Well, how, how do they? You know? How do they in Rwanda? Yeah, I mean, some of them do it coldly, and some of them do it very warmly. As I said in this morning, you know, there is an individual element to all of it, right? There is an individual element to how resilient a person is. Um, oftentimes, forgiveness is a big question, an apology, that if an apology from a perpetrator is seen as genuine and real, people can tend to get along better. Some people turn a blind eye in home, they say one thing, and in public they act a different way. But I do think reconciliation is moving forward in Rwanda, especially since we don't see as many revenge killings. We don't see um, really this kind of um, animosity anymore. People don't walk around and identify each other in certain ways. But in the villages, you can imagine, it's very, very hard when you have one surviving member of a family who knows that there are 10 or 15 
family members of the perpetrator. Um, but then on the other side, we have stories of um, survivors' children and perpetrators' children marrying, of, of survivor families bringing perpetrators' families food in prison, of people really working together because that's their goal. And I think, again, it comes up at the at the concept of public service and personal service. And it's just so hard to ask people to put this aside... Is a, this, is a real problem yeah. in, this is a real problem in Africa, generally. Yeah. You know, that, I mean, I th I th it was a bigger problem, I think, in the independence generation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. My, you know, I'm not, I'm not an Africa expert. I lived here, worked here for the last three years, three and a half years. But um, you know, like looking, reading the history, and you know, my la last post in South Sudan. You know, there's a lot of people who I, they get into, they get independence, and then I, they because they suffered for so long. I think they just the country is mine. It's my personal bank right. account. It's my personal property. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to treat it like that. And to hell with the citizens. The right. citizens exist to 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 serve me. And they're if they die, they die. I mean, that, that callousness really that's that's a real problem. Yeah, and the truth is, it's a mindset shift. You know, it's a mindset shift that comes from um, post-colonial society. It comes with educating citizens, with instilling citizens about peace education, public service. Um, many things that can really create a new generation of people who are engaging in leadership in Africa in a different way. And I think that it really boils down to that in each context. Who are the leaders who are going to be dedicated to the service of their country, maybe who didn't suffer in that way, um, or maybe who did, but have the ability to move forward for whatever reasons. Um, I also think that um, especially for the African continent, there's. Um, it, I think it. I think it's getting better. I do. I do, and we see. We see people like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf from Sierra Leone. I'm sorry, from Liberia. Mm -hmm. We see people like Ellen Johnson Sirleaf from Liberia sensitizing people that power will, will be um, turned over and elections will happen peacefully and this is for our country. Um, sensitizing them and teaching them. And the question is, how do you get people to internalize the messages that are being given to them? Right? And in Liberia it worked and there was a peaceful turnover of power, peaceful elections. And so I think that these mindset shifts of um, public service, of what can people gain from working together, and especially when we're dealing with such grave issues like death. I mean, the trauma is really terrible and the alternative is just so much better. So. This is what I really like. I mean, I think I think one of the best things that our, my government does in Africa is the Young African Leaders Initiative. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, we've taken thousands of, of people who in, in 20 years they're, they're going to be, they're already doing incredible things. Uh, in 20 years they're going to be heading, C they're going to be CEOs of, of businesses that empower women, they're going to be foreign ministers, they're going to be, and I, I just think it's an incredible program to take, and, and you know, like that was the hope in, when I was in South Sudan, it's like these these young people that were saying to the United States, like the, it, but there's a process, right, of 20 mm -hmm. years, tw it, it'll take 10 years yeah. or 20 years for them to, that the bush fighters to go off into the sunset and do whatever they're yeah, going to do. Yeah, and I and think in, in about 10, 10 to 20, 10, 15 years, because some of the Yali Young African Leadership Initiative fellows are a little bit older mm -hmm. and even more advanced in their career. Even in five or 10 years, they will be in huge positions of power. And the hope is that the things they've learned, but also the networks they've gained exactly. among their own national Yali fellows and the other regional fellows in East Africa, and then the fellows amongst the continent, will create a generation of change makers who are dedicated to those kinds of um, values. And that's one of the great things I think about the Yali program and also the Fulbright program, yep. which is the program that I'm on, dedicated to cultural diplomacy, to showing how... Um, how people of different backgrounds and different values can work together in terms of educating each other, sharing best practices, and sharing hope for the future. You know, I mean, our country right now, people are concerned in many ways. And I have to share that as a Fulbright scholar in a responsible way where people see America positively but understand that America is not perfect. Mm -hmm. Just like Rwanda is not perfect, just like Ethiopia is not perfect, just like nowhere is perfect. And so that's the charge of the, the Fulbright, not only to do our research or our teaching or our medical work or whatever it is, 
but to teach about the lessons we've learned from our own societies and when Fulbrighters come to the United States for them to do the same thing. And so these, these moments of cultural exchange um, are so significant um, the way you think and approach problems. Same with Yali. And one thing I'll mention was Marta this morning from IPSS mm. was a Fulbrighter and she right. came from um, here I think and got her PhD at George Mason University in the United States and just the way she spoke about Senator Fulbright and how I resonated with the same values that he had of of being in a room and talking about problems in an open way that's geared toward solutions mm -hmm. and that's geared toward at least starting a conversation that will lead toward something better. Those were the goals of Senator Fulbright, but to bring that globally. And um, that's one of the things I've been so proud about in terms of being a Fulbrighter. You know, I mean, when, when we mentioned youth and we mentioned some of the some of the issues that are going on, like it just there's so there's so much promise in Africa, but there's also a lot of danger. You know, because there there is a chance that the current leadership in, across Africa is going to going to miss the boat mm -hmm. on on doing the reforms and doing the things that they need to do to bring in the young people and to make Africa a place where young people want to live and where they want to build their family, you know, have their families mm -hmm. and where they want to go to school and you know, when 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 your society's corrupt, when you have the same leader, you know, is in power and just won't leave, right? The overstate is welcome, or her. I mean, I, I don't think there's an example of a woman leader in Africa who's overstate her welcome, right? No. But um, you know, overstate their welcome, where there's corruption, where there's with lack of jobs, whether it's you know a lack of democracy or free you know freedom of speech or whatever these things that, that we I don't want to put a, an American model on Africa, right? I mean, there's any there are a number of ways that pre people can create society that people want to live in, but you know. It's so young. Africa is so young, and if 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 there's not a commitment from African leadership to to give and listen, and I think it's going to be it's going to be kind of a it's going to be a lot of yeah. transitioning going on. Right? I really think one of <laughs> yeah. the wisest things that African leaders can do is to invest in youth, but truly, you know, not to invest in youth in. Do not, do not say, and, do not yeah. say, oh, we 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 yeah, we support the youth. Oh, here's a youth group that may or may not have any feedback into the way that we do mm -hmm. anything. But we created it, yeah. right? But, I mean, we but, see even in Rwanda, political parties now have youth members of parliament, younger members of mm. parliament. They're trying to roll over. You won't see these older generations anymore. And it's being perceived as a positive change. I also think that one of the recommendations I made was about approaching leadership differently. Mm -hmm. Right? That leadership are not just certain elites who studied here, who are from this clan or this class or this family tie, but what does leadership mean? Leadership means a vision, a way to lead people into the future that they want. Mm -hmm. And I think that re-identifying what leadership means on the continent is really important. Ambassador Leonard said yesterday that West Africa is doing it quite well. And part of my recommendation as well is to find these young people who are doing just that and who are developing themselves and who are becoming leaders in their fields and connect them to each other and, and help support them from within and from without and see what change can be made there because I believe in that. I've done a lot of work with youth. I'm still young myself and um, I really believe that there is huge potential. I wouldn't Go be ahead working here. Rub it in. Go yeah. ahead and rub it in. <laughs> that I'm young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but yeah. you're dressed better than me. Uh, so, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah. I, I think we're I think we're getting low on time. Mm -hmm. uh, e. Wells looking at his, uh, his recorder here. Let me, one thing I did want to touch on uh, and maybe it's too, too heavy be a note for a conclusion but we can massage that if we have to mm -hmm. lighten it up if we need to um, you mentioned that today that leaders leaders in order to get to the point where transitional justice can begin that leaders who are bad leaders failed leaders leaders who are leading their country in the in the wrong direction need to realize that waging peace becomes it becomes more profitable uh, than waging war can you can you expound on that a little bit yeah sure you know in many ways we see that the the pleas the cries the number of dead um, the heinous crimes don't resonate with the top leaders they still continue to wage war and to commit human rights violations 
um, at no cost almost. So the question becomes almost removing the human aspect and putting it as a calculation. When does waging peace and creating a peaceful society become more beneficial than waging war? And what mechanisms do stakeholders have to push in that direction to say what you're doing right now, the war, the violence, is not going to be good for you in the future as a leader? So what I hear is a, the punitive measures. Uh, what, what is there a connection between punitive, like uh, getting, getting, getting to that destination? Yeah, where people... there's, there's a very loose connection between courts and deterrence. It's not proven so, so much in the academic research, but there is some, um, some connection between an indictment or um, an ICC indictment or, or a European Court of Justice or African, um, East African Court of Justice indictment of a leader and deterrence mm -hmm. that they will stop what they're doing. But it has to be more than that. Mm -hmm. um, we can use our traditional methods, sanctions. We can use... Um, other methods, but I think also being creative is what we're going to have to do. Using from the ground up, peaceful, not necessarily liberation or or violent movements, mm -hmm. but peaceful movements, uh, networks of people saying no to the status quo, um, whether yeah, that's protests, society, petitions, yeah. civil society networks, and garnering that into a group of leadership that creates a viable alternative. Is there a role for the international community in that? Yes, absolutely. Would absolutely. You, but I understand that I understand this is probably not in your a mm -hmm. little bit outside of your tangential it is. To, to what you study, but what's your opinion about the role the international community can play in I mean international facilitating? community can create political will. Look at Burundi since 2015. People have been dying. People have been fleeing, even South Sudan. Political will is created, I think, by the signaling of international community, by um, world powers, by in regional organizations, United Nations, and especially people, quote unquote, putting their money where their mouth is, sending in more peacekeepers, sending in more funding for aid, sending in poverty relief, um, and not necess or, or sanctioning governments doing things that signal that what that leader is doing is not okay. Whether it's because we don't believe in it, we believe in human rights, as is the case in U.S. and normative standard, or whether they believe it's just not going to work. Lives lost are money lost, is, is profit lost, whatever. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a humanistic and values-based calculation or not. So I think that the international community can play a huge role, and I think it's incredibly important uh, even if we think these are people who are far away, so different than us, they don't affect us. The truth is the world has become so interconnected and so interconnected in terms of economy, so socially, um, security, but even soft issues like the way we can see things on social media and mm -hmm. have a pen pal or relate to someone online on Facebook Messenger or WhatsApp. This is the world today, and we can't let people stand by and and be hurt. Well, Samantha, I know, I know now we've run out of time. Uh, I was just wondering, what's, what's next for you? Yeah, so I plan to finish my PhD in two to three semesters, so either May or December 2019, and we'll see. Um, I'll be looking for maybe teaching positions or maybe government work or international organizations. I never had an ideal job, but I want to stay in the game. I want to stay working with Rwanda and Great Lakes region in whatever capacity will best serve the needs um, at the time. And, so. and maybe a professional tap dancer? <laughs> Probably not. I didn't go to conservatory. I went to college. So um, there was that. But I will always continue tap dancing. And um, I also hope that uh, my dissertation will get published into a book. That's a big hope for me. And that it'll be something that can serve as a guidebook for some people in this sphere as well beyond Rwanda. Any potential titles for that book? Yes, I do have one. Um, so the potential title I have right now is Quibuka, Divergent Memory in the Quest for, for Post-Genocide Justice. So Quibuka, 
divergent memory in the quest for post-genocide justice. And what, what is Quibuqua again? Quibuqua means to remember. Okay. It's also the name of the official commemoration process in Rwanda. But why I like it is because I really do speak in Rwanda. And so I think it's a nice word that captures, um, that really captures the concept, but it's also very authentic to me because it's a word I use very often in my interviews and in my work. Well, how do you say... Uh Goodbye in Ki Ki Rwanda. In Ki Rwanda, you could say Morabeho, see you later. You could say Morakoze Chane, thank you so much. Um, but Morabeho, see you later. Morabeho. Okay, yes. well, you well. Morabeho Chane. Morakoze Chane. Are you kidding me? Morakoze <laughs> Chane. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, okay. Thank you, you well. Thank you, Samantha. Samantha Lake and everyone, uh, and. Uh, I look for her book uh, to be published at some point in the future, I hope. Yes, thank you so much. Real Talk USA. It's my house, come on, turn it up. The hour where the U.S. mission to the African Union comes to you through Afro FM 105.3 to highlight the United States partnership in Africa. Current issues will be discussed. Guests will engage on a variety of topics ranging from politics to jazz. Co-hosted by A.U.L. Salomon of Afro FM and Chris Mead of USAU. The show will air every Thursday from 5 to 6 p.m. Feel free to participate by sending messages to the USAU social media sites www.usau.usmission.gov or www.facebook.com forward slash USAU and follow USAU on twitter.com forward slash USAU Real Talk USA It's my house <laughs>